I'm not sure if shoes are easier to shop for uh, and to figure out what shoe is best for you for training, for racing, or if it's more complex, more muddied. You recently created uh, an excellent YouTube video rounding out the top five training shoes so far this year, kind of a a mid-year, a mid-2024 check-in appropriately halfway through this year. And you've got the same treatment coming up for the super shoes for racing shoes, which will be a video that's going to drop in the next couple of days. So we thought it'd be a good time to talk about how it is you go about shopping for shoes, what shoes you select for training and for racing, what the heck all these different categories are now. It used to be, used to be neutral, used to be uh, stability, and then you get your racing shoes as well. Uh, what's the lay of the land right now for us? Yeah, those categories still exist, but I wouldn't say that they're the main qualifier of what a shoe is. It's not about stability neutral as much as it's about the speed of the shoe. And by that, I mean, I think you have like three categories of shoes now, okay? You have your training shoes, which are the shoes that your dad wears and the shoes that probably you've worn for most of your running career. Um, they're the Asics Nimbus or they're the Nike Pegasus. The, the good rule of thumb is if the shoe has a big number in its name, it's a training shoe because it's been around for a really long time. It's your bread and butter. Okay. Then you have the super shoes. The super shoes are those fancy racing shoes that we see. First, we started seeing all the elites wearing them. And now mostly everybody who enters a race is wearing a pair of super shoes. So that's your Nike Vaporfly or your Adidas Adios Pro they have carbon plates in them that's their main differentiator and they also have a pretty big slab of foam that we call piba foam p is for polymer it's basically just a more responsive lighter foam and if you've ever tried a pair of super shoes on you know what they feel like they just bounce off the ground way more than your classic training shoes and they're quite a bit lighter that's two categories the third and i'd say probably the most recent category are the super trainers which is kind of a hybrid of both Right, you have it's a shoe with this cool foam, maybe not a carbon plate, but the main differentiator is that they're massive. They're made to save the feet. They're made to give you a little bit more support than a training shoe for your everyday workouts, but also are spring loaded so that they make you feel fast. And the rule of thumb is, you know, if you want if you don't mind buying a few pairs of shoes, you use training shoes for easy runs. You use super trainers for workouts and then super shoes for races. That's like probably the most simple way to lay it out. Okay. I think I'm missing a pair of shoes then. <laughs> oh, really? Buy, uh, yes. Um, what a shame. I think I have an excuse to buy a new pair of shoes because Alex told me to. Because <laughs> <laughs> I've got, you know, what are you missing? I'm missing, I'm missing the super trainers. I don't yeah. have, I think I'm doing the workouts in either a trainer probably i think an everyday trainer or i'm using my my retired super shoes from the recent marathon so i'm missing i'm missing that in between super trainer that i definitely want to to give a try to if if you tell me i'm going to be faster in my workouts then i'll do it yeah well you and everybody else and i think that's why <laughs> super trainers exist like a couple years ago many people had bought a pair of super shoes and that was for their races only and did yep. all of their other runs in training shoes. But then when it came to that, that key session, right, the, the few workouts that you do before the race to really tune up, people would ask themselves, should I just keep wearing my regular old trainers or do I put on my super shoes to simulate a race? The problem with that, obviously, is if you keep wearing super shoes and training, you wear them out. They're not all that durable. I think they probably last about 200, 300 kilometers and they're super expensive. So people were ripping through their super shoes and there was a gap there. You need a, a, that third middling pair of shoes. And I use them for all workouts. I get these super shoes, or sorry, these super trainers. Um, they, 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 they fill, they fill a, they fill a gap in, in the, in the arsenal of shoes now for most people. Yeah. I think that, I think what was happening as Caitlin just touched upon is that for quite a while. So, okay. So the super shoe came out 2017, 2018, they start to really kind of trickle into the mainstream and you run like, I don't know, a couple, say like two marathons in the Nike vapor fly or whatever. And then you start second guessing the, uh, how much juice, how much oomph is left in 
your super shoe when you go into marathon number three and you're like, well, I want to get that four-ish percent bump in performance. I want to shave off those seconds or even minutes uh, and attack a personal best in the marathon. So I'm not leaving any time on the table. I'm going to reload, buy a fresh pair of shoes. And of course, like the Nike or a, a then Adidas and other brands, marketing was pretty good. So you get lured into the latest iteration. But then he had this like 350-ish or more dollar pair of, of yeah. shoes that you're kind of looking at them and you're like, there's still a little bit of life left in these. So you transition into using them in workouts uh, yeah. or in long runs as well. Because I think one of the sneaky uh cool upsides of the super shoe and now the super trainer is that you can bounce back pretty quickly from a hard workout or a long run by wearing these things because they've just got so much cushioning to them right and at first we were seeing elite uh, reports of elite athletes doing this training a lot more in those shoes because they're able to recover a lot better from a 20 mile long run um, particularly with a lot of hard effort in there and then you start hearing about recreational runners doing the same thing. I know quite a few runners that do that, that still do that. Um, but that's a pretty expensive proposition, especially when you start buying a super shoe to use for training. So yeah, the super trainer makes a lot of sense. Okay. So Alex, you've the, obviously the night, let's say about 85, 90% of your running is going to be done in an everyday trainer, maybe like eight to 10, maybe even 15% is done in, in a super trainer, or maybe even more. Maybe if you're doing your long runs super in there, the super trainer might take up about 20%, kind of the 80, 20 rule. And then there's like a one or 2% that you're, uh, that you're running in a super shoe and you're racing. So that big 80% slab of running that you're going to do all the volume you're going to do for throughout the entire summer for that fall marathon or training for a 10 K or a half marathon you did a v video where you recommended a top five train everyday trainers. Like what's your, what are your picks? What are your recommendations for, for anybody who I, I'm the, I'm new to running or I'm just looking to get a fresh pair of shoes. Alex, tell me what shoes I should buy. <laughs> so there's the ranking video. And then also we made a video after that. So we'll start with this actually was my number four training shoe in my personal ranking. Okay. But this shoe i pick that that is the one i tell people they should buy when they ask me they've never run before they want to buy a pair of shoes i i tell them to get the a6 nimbus 26 and the reason for that is it's a safe shoe i've been wearing it lately coming back from injury it's not a fast shoe it's not a sexy shoe whatsoever you don't bounce no. off the ground wearing an a6 nimbus again your dad wears it right you've seen it for years it, but what it is, it's durable, lasts a really long time. Like I've worn pairs of Nimbus for like 1200 kilometers, which is a really long time running. And also they're comfortable. They have the support and I've never had an issue with them. So that that's like my safe recommendation for my own personal preference. I ranked number four. Do you want to go, you want me to go five to one favorite shoes? Just, just run through the top five very quickly so that, you know, if you're obviously, if you're not a Nasix person, you can be like, oh, well then there's a Brooks or a, uh, um, a new balance option or whatever. Yeah. Well, okay. Well, we'll start at five, five was the Hoka Clifton nine. The cool part about that shoe is that it's super cushioned, but it's light. It, it would float in a puddle. Let's say, uh, it's not that durable. <laughs> That's the issue with it. My Clifton's tend to flame out after 600 kilometers, but for someone yeah, who wants a light training shoe. That's a good pick. If you're a fan of Hoka's, go for it. Number four is the Nimbus that I just mentioned. Number three, I went with Brooks, the Glycerin 21. I haven't worn much Brooks in my life, but oh, this right. one, it's a Goldilocks, right? It's it's kind of lightweight. It has good durability, good support, right? It's not the best at any category, but it's quite solid. And I like wearing it because it makes me feel a little bit bouncy on my easy runs without me going too fast and without it being too spring loaded and make me run out of control. The glycerin's a good pick. Number two, I went with the New Balance 880 V14. A little bias on my end. I grew up on New Balance. The Zantes were an absolute hit for me. They don't oh, make man. them anymore. No, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And the, the 880s are probably the closest thing to that. Somewhat smaller as a training shoe bounce off the ground pretty well still has some good support and just fit well on my feet and number one i went off the map and i thought mm -hmm. people would 
respond to that video being like, oh, cool. This is a cool new shoe. I got torn apart. People hate this shoe. <laughs> Nike Invincible Run 3. It's like, it's a weird shoe. It doesn't feel like the others. It it ha it does have a bit of muscle. You can maybe make a case for it being a super trainer just because it has a big slab of pretty responsive foam. It's a rigid shoe. It puts your foot straight and kind of guides you through your run. The reason I picked it is because I just feel natural. My stride doesn't feel too awkward when I run in it. And also that one too has lasted me about 1,200 kilometers. So, and I still have it. I haven't thrown them out yet. So the Nike Invincible Run 3, if you're somewhat curious to try a new kind of, of training shoe, was that, that was top notch for me. I have to admit, I'm one of those people that was just kind of shaking my head. When we were going through the edits of that video, I was like, I'll look, whoa, that's like a, a bold top pick. I'm like, I'm not a big fan of that, in, the Invincible shoe. I, maybe I haven't put enough kilometers in it or miles in it. And you, you did touch upon something really important about running shoes overall is that there's kind of two different subdomains uh, experientially with training shoes. There's the, you put it on and it's just like, it's the glass slipper, except running in a glass slip, slipper would totally suck. But uh, it's like the equivalent of the glass slipper. You just put it on. It's like, oh, that just, it just feels right. My foot fits. This is magic. And I have that experience when I wear Brooks shoes. Yeah, uh, and that's like the magic of Brooks. And I think the highest, the highest, uh, uh, um, the highest compliment that you can give to a shoe company is that they make shoes. I don't know how they do it. They make shoes that where you slip them on, you're just like that, that, uh, abused running term comes to mind plush. You're just like, oh, this is, this is just, this is a, this feels whatever the word plush this, that's how my feet feel right now. Uh, it's like saying the word plush and the Nike shoe, totally different than that. Kind of firm, kind of weird, like just kind of like, but you have to break it in. And I think that that's the the big issue. So maybe if you're willing to go on a few runs where you're kind of wondering why you bought the shoe, it may pay dividends in the end, but that's a very risky proposition, right? It's, it's really hard to buy a shoe and convince yourself that it's going to work out and then it works out. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why I think people just need to go to stores and test out shoes for themselves because there is some personal variability, right? Some people hate long, like big heel to toe drop, like the the vertical difference between how tall the heel is in the show, the, the shoe and how tall the toe is. Some people can't deal with it. Some people like zero drop. For some people, it's the opposite. You need to try out shoes. So my thing is I've never liked Saucony shoes. I've tried. Really? They've been okay. big for so long. A lot of people like them, especially their mainstays, like the Kinvara's, the Saucony Ride. I'm convinced that they're good shoes because most people do enjoy them, but they don't work for me. I get shin splints. I get pains. They don't feel comfortable. And I think that's just it. Sometimes your feet don't mesh with a certain type of shoe. And that's why like, don't, don't just watch the video and order the shoes online. Go to the running store, try them out. The best running stores are the ones that like let you go outside, like in the parking lot and do a couple strides in the shoes. That's so helpful. And, you know, I, I, I wish I would have done that a bit more in my past because sometimes I just bought shoes because they looked cool and I wanted to like them. One of them is the Pegasus. The Nike Pegasus, I, I cannot deal with. I can't stand it. It's too shallow for my foot. I wear orthotics and my heel pops out and it sucks because they're cool and oftentimes they're cheap when you find them at outlet stores and when they're the previous models. But but I gave up. It just doesn't work for me. Do, do you guys have like a a shoe that you can't deal with or <laughs> that you hate? Mm. I think I've been trying for a really long time. It's not that it's just I've been I want to love Hoka. I oh, want to, wow. <laughs> I, I want to love Hoka because all the trail scene people use Hoka. Hoka is the big brand. Um, I have had some good experiences with Hoka, but like for me to use a Hoka shoe, I have to be like, if I'm thinking about trail running, it has to be like basically a road because the shoes are so clunky that I feel like I need less surface area being covered to have really good control over technical terrain. Interesting. So that's the thing that's been, yeah, it's been like tricky for me because I just can't, I try them out and I just, I, I find myself switching back um, to other stuff. 
I mean, for road, as you said, the 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 Cinderella shoe, Brooks is for me. I have you know the glycerin, I have the trace, I have the launch, I have I love Brooks, and actually, I'm gonna try out. I just um, they're coming today, which is so exciting. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna try. Um, well, the Divide is actually a hybrid shoe that Brooks did between Trail and road and i wore that in black canyon a couple of years ago because it wasn't going to be so technical and i loved that so i got another pair of those that i'm going to try out and i'm going back to the uh cascadia which is an old brooks. oh wow yeah yeah Classic. it's an old brooks uh trail running shoe and they've kind of made the toe box a little wider so i'm super psych psyched about that and i'm actually getting those today so i'm excited to try those out this weekend um on on my trail run but i think like i just want to love hoka and I just haven't been able to get into the groove with them. But but like a disaster shoe, not yet. Michael, do you have a disaster shoe? I don't have a full on like unmitigated disaster. Uh, I'm pretty flexible when it comes to shoes. I've I've been fortunate enough working in the, this industry for a long time now to test out like every single shoe and many iterations of every shoe over the years i would say um for a super shoe the alpha fly i've always kind of wanted to like the alpha fly it's like it's kip shogi's shoe it's like it's close to like a you know lebron and then has gets has the lebron shoe and there was the the kobe shoe i believe like basketball players always have like the, of course the air jordans Jordan. and and the the alpha fly is kind of the was kind of the closest thing to like a runner getting a signature chew as, as you can get in, in our world, in the marathon world in particular. And so I was kind of always excited and intrigued by the alpha fly. Um, and it just never worked for me. It was sort of like, I have a narrow foot, but it just felt so I, it should work. Cause it's kind of known to be a narrow shoe with a high arch. And it just didn't feel like it, my foot didn't fit in it properly. And I just never could do the alpha fly. Uh, but Alex, similar to you, like the Pegasus, I'm very hit and miss with. My issue with the Pegasus is this. It feels like a fantastic kind of just right everyday neutral trainer when you put it on your foot and you're right. It's so alluring because Nike, they just, they know how to do the marketing, right? It's it just looks good. The colorways are nice. Oh, yeah. And, and I find they wear out for me fairly quickly. Like I find the, I'm a mid to four foot striker. So I find it gets really thin in the forefoot pretty quickly after just like, you know, 200 miles. I'm like, Ugh, I'm just not getting as much out of that shoe as I want. I want that shoe to last 500 miles and, or 800 K or whatever. And I just find it's lasting less than that. So I need a little bit more out of my shoe than that. That would be the, that would be my, it's just like a, a mild disappointment from time to time. And, I, yeah, guys, so what are you wearing right now? I think this is a great, um, a great segue until what's on your feet. Like what's, what's your, what's your go-to shoe right now? What do you put in the miles in on Alex? What do you, the red dirt of Prince Edward Island? What are you, what are you covering in that, in that iconic, uh, that iconic scree? Yeah. If I come back to Toronto next week, people will think I've been to Kenya because my sneakers are all red. It's like, no, it's not so cool. I've just been on the island. No, me, it's the Nimbus right now, just to come back from injury. Usually I alternate. I know I know you both alternate shoes, but my, I had some packing issues. Basically needed to stuff a bunch of podcasting gear inside of a backpack and can only fit one pair of shoes. And I thought, well, well done. if I'm running that much right now, one pair of Asics Nimbus should do the trip. And so far I've been I've been happy with it. I was hoping to get into a racing season with the Alpha Fly, but it's the same. And there's so much shame with noticing that the Alpha Fly is not for you because it's like, it's, it's the, like you said, it's the Nike shoe. So it's like, Nike's not the problem. You're the problem. You should, you should be fitting in these shoes. So racing shoes, still not sure what I'll be wearing up this year. I like, I like mm. smaller super shoes as opposed to bigger super shoes. So, Alpha Fly, probably not. I have a couple choices of what I'm probably going to wear. Nike Vaporfly 3 is a sleeper for me because it's the understudy of the Alpha Fly, right? It's just not as sexy, but it's smaller and I think it's lighter and I think it's faster and I think it's better. And it's shaped a whole lot like there's an ASIC shoe that I really like, the Metaspeed Paris, same thing on the smaller 
quote unquote minimalist size for the super shoe you know, compared to your big massive alpha flies and co so either these two so i i think soon enough i'll be in a rotation of mm -hmm. asics nimbus hoka skyward x super trainer leave that out there and either the asics meta speed paris and or nike vapor fly for racing yeah, I think my shoe rotation right now is obviously some sort of the Brooks because I'm I'm rotating out the glycerin, the newer glycerins, and the Asics Nova Blast, which I love, which I mm -hmm. use today. Yeah, those have been great for me. And my question mark of the super trainers that I would like to add into the rotation. And I'm also a Vaporfly lover ever since the my marathon that I just ran and I used the Vaporfly and I absolutely loved them. So I think that will be when I do an, another marathon or any road racing, I would like to use definitely the Vaporflies again. Cause, but I did, I do think they're so cool looking. I had the like neon orange ones with the purple check. I thought mm -hmm. they were Super Ooh. cool looking. Yeah, they were really awesome. It was like when I was running and they took the photos of me running at the marathon, I could only see the shoes. Like I could, it was just like this, you know, neon uh light coming out of the, the road. But um, but yeah, that's pretty much what I'm what I'm using right now. I uh I am rotating right now through like Caitlin. I'm wearing a pair of brooks and I had a similar experience that you have both described with that that plush feeling when I put on a pair of Brooks launch. Okay. So the launch is a bit of an oddball in the Brooks lineup because it's kind of a, I think it's been positioned now as being kind of a stripped down, almost like trainer workout shoe slash maybe kind of more like recreational racer shoe as well. Cause it's fairly basic. It's like a basic neutral trainer, quick trainer. But I kind of like that feeling. I've always sort of drifted towards, I can wear a pretty light shoe uh, and it doesn't seem to bother me. My love affair with with shoes, my 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 one true life partner with, with running shoes has always been the Adidas Adios, which has gone through many, many inter iterations and has now graduated into super shoe stardom as being the Adios Pro. But they also still make the Adios kind of racing slipper that doesn't have any of the uh, Piba foam or the the carbon plate. And I still buy those. So I still have a pair of those. I wear a pair of Adios, oh, sorry, Adidas uh, Boston for yeah. some of my workouts. But Alex, now that you've brought up the super trainer as a, a core component of your weekly running, I think I might adopt that approach as well and find myself the just right super trainer. I'm not sure which one yet. I I'm intrigued by your love of the, the Hocus Skyward X. Uh, we tested that in Boston and it was a nice looking shoe and it, 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 it by all accounts sounds like it kind of delivers on the, the conceit. And in terms of in terms of super shoes, in terms of the big race, I'm going to go after it in Chicago this October and I want a good shoe. I want the best shoe. I don't know what I'm going to go with. I am thankfully done with this worn out pair of Nike vapor flies, the like lime green ones. I, it was just the worst, <laughs> worst frigging colorway ever. And when they came out with the green and the pink, I didn't like either color. I was like, I don't know. I'll take the green ones, I guess. I'm so happy that I'm finally done with those. Those are trash. They're finished. So I'm going to I'm gonna treat myself going into uh, Chicago. And I what I want, Alex knows what I'm going to say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, want, I want the Adidas Adios Pro Evo 1 or 2, if they have a second one coming out in the fall, which I suspect they will because we've seen it on some elite runners feet this spring. And I think it will be featured heavily in the Olympics as well. It's that super duper light, absolute, like it's the alpha fly killer. There was a lot of hype around it because it was, we did it. We did a, a segment on this, I believe in the past where it was a lot of hype on around the shoe because it was allegedly a one and done one marathon. And then it was cooked and then you couldn't run it anymore. It was like all it had in it was one marathon, but it would give you your greatest marathon. 
That's apparently untrue. Alex and I have done some reporting on that. We talked to some engineers from uh, Adidas, some shoe designers, and they said, no, no, this is like totally a misunderstanding. It lasts longer than that. So bring me the Evo. I want the Evo. It also looks, it just look aesthetically, it's a beautiful looking shoe too. Uh, mm. So very minimal, very classic lines. It kind of looks like the, it looks like the, like if, if uh, the Adios shoe, which I've always loved, is like a classic sports car, the Evo version kind of looks like an F1 version. Um, it's yeah. just like there's there's no doors on this thing. There's no roof. There's no windshield. It's just you put the you put the driver in the center, and it's a giant engine and tires, and it goes right with a lot of downforce. So mm -hmm. that's the shoe I want. We'll see if I can actually get my hands on a pair because there's an issue with like they only make like 500 of them. So, um, yeah, that's where I'm at. Um, what's, what's your, I mean, I sort of teased what my all-time favorite shoe is. Do you guys have an all-time favorite? I, a shoe came to mind as, as we were chatting. I mean, okay. All-time favorite shoe. Yeah. You'd almost need to break down categories. So I, to keep it simple, let me bring up this one shoe that I have in my basement and that I've been wearing for my bike rides my stationary bike rides here to do my last part of my daily training i get on the spin bike there's a shoe here that i haven't worn in just about seven years and i found it in the basement it's a shoe of a bygone era the minimalist era when there was no carbon plates no piba foam and the metric by which we evaluated shoes was only one lightness mm -hmm. Mizuno got ahead of the game at this point. Okay. They made a pair of shoes that was lighter than any pair of shoes I've ever encountered, I think, in the world. If I'm wrong, I'd love for someone to let me know. 2.9 ounces. Okay. Mizuno Wave Universe. There were five iterations. I had number five. They're glorified slippers. <laughs> I wore them for a 10K once. I couldn't do stairs. For the next three days and it was i was staying in my friend's basement because he was in ottawa where the race was and so uh, me and my other friends who were completely knees deep inside of this minimalist phase or, or belief couldn't even get down to our bedrooms our calves were so torn up anyway i kept the shoes they're full of blood it's more Ooh. of a statement piece at this point i like it and, and i i took it and i I took it and I took one of my like New Balance Super Comp trainers, which is massive, and I compared the two. And I'd say the, the Mizuno Wave Universe is a third the size, but they're slippers. You throw them up in the air outside and the wind blows them away. It is crazy. And I wouldn't wear them these days because I think they're terrible for your legs. But, oh, I just, I admire the boldness and Mizuno's boldness to make these slippers to see how many people would buy them. Oh my goodness. I'm, th I'm I'm trying to think. That's why I'm still quiet. I'm like, okay, I don't think that I can say a favorite pair of shoes, but I'm going to piggyback on the minimalist phase that we all go through. And so <sighs> when I started trail running, I had some great support down here from Innovate. And so Innovate. Oh, yeah. Has, yeah. <laughs> With the so, eight. In, yeah, the eight. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Innovate. And so um, you would think that they were more maybe like shoes to work out in, at the gym but they do have trail running shoes and when i started trail running about 11 years ago i think one of my first pairs of shoes were innovates and i can't even remember the model that's how long ago we're talking a very very long time ago i've got pictures somewhere um but i thought that they were super fun shoes and yeah i was running much more minimal. as a trail runner i really have liked hard shoes for a long time because i like to feel the trail especially here where everything's so technical it's not like if i were on you know nice gravel smooth trails and roads it would be a little different because i could use something that's a little cushier but so the innovate was really great for tricky technical terrain because you're really close to the ground um but and i and i do believe that those were zero drops so that was i have come far <laughs> from the minimalist stage and I don't really use minimal shoes anymore at all and I've got that nice heel to toe drop in all of my shoes and stuff but I did go through that phase Alex with those like super light minimal you know zero drop shoes uh as well for a while I feel like the minimalist phase I feel like in the running and your running journey going through the minimalist phase is kind of like when you like 
when you're like a, a, a freshman in college and you discover Marxism and you read the communist manifesto. And for like a couple of years, you're like, we need to change society, man. We need to do this. We need to do things differently. This is crazy. Capitalism is evil. And, you know, and then you grow up and you just kind of give up on that stuff. Or maybe you don't. And kudos to you, I guess. But the uh, I feel like that's the minimalist phase where it's just like, it's all a lie. Cushioning is a lie. <laughs> and then you get to be, you know, in your old age of your, you know, 30s or 40s. And you're just like, you know what? A little bit of a little bit a slab of something underfoot is not a bad idea. Like um, this hurts a little bit. Yeah, it hurts a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like I want I want to pretend this is this is easy, but it's not. Although I I will say that I do like a lighter shoe. Like I do I do like to feel the ground underneath my feet a little bit. So yeah, 